Conflict in the church? What? Right. Does ever have conflict in the church? Is this on? So I'll make sure this is on. Everybody hear me okay? Very good. All right. No, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've never experienced conflict in the church. <laughs> well, there was the time uh, I was a rookie preacher, I mean, r- literally in my first year, and uh, after the first charge conference, those of you United Methodists, you know what I'm talking about, the annual meeting with the district superintendent, and, at the, and there was a vote that happened that one guy was really not happy about, and at the end he, walked, he made a beeline for me, puts his finger in my face and says, this means war. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, there was the, there was a church uh, that was uh, going through the whole process about purchasing some land adjacent to, so they could expand. And so uh, it, it seemed like a slam dunk. Everything's fine. And then come to find out when the vote failed, uh, come to find out there had been a person who didn't want it to pass and had been going around talking to people very quietly to completely undermine the entire process. That's fun. Um, let me see. see if I can, let me see if I can remember any more. Um, oh, and then there was COVID. I tell you, friends, we, we preachers often say of some situation, seminary did not prepare me for this. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, that was, I, I got no words, really. By far the most difficult time I've ever experienced in a church um, because any decision you make is wrong and any decision you make, somebody is gone, somebody, I mean, it's just, it was just, uh, yeah, not a fun time. So yeah, conflict in the church, it it seems to be a thing. So so there there was one particular time that uh, I had, I was fairly new to a church, Uh, matter of fact, it was in the first month and somebody came up to me and they said, you know, there's some of us really need to talk to you Okay, <laughs> all right, sure, um, that's fine. Uh, is there food involved? But, um, that's usually my first question. Uh, okay, sure, and, uh, and they said, well, yeah, it's, it's some of us who are the children's Sunday school teachers need to talk to you. Okay, let's, sure, let's meet. So we had this meeting, and, and uh, boy, they start going down the list because this church had a pretty active children's ministry. They also had a very large and active preschool and so the rooms that got used by the preschool during the week were also used by the Sunday school teachers on Sunday morning. Shared space in a church, anybody? <laughs> what could go wrong? Yeah, they had, a, they had a long list of the things that they did not like about what the preschool teachers did in those rooms and the way they left the room and the, mm, mm, you know, okay. Yeah, so, so a little bit of conflict there. So yeah, conflict in the church because where two or three are gathered, there will be conflict. There will be conflict because, because, well, we humans, that's just what we do, right? I mean, there's conflict, there's disagreements. I mean, all the way from just, you know, minor disagreements all the way to, you know, really big, big things. So conflict is something we have to know uh, a little bit about. Uh, I think the, the biggest fights I've ever heard about in churches was when they say, we're going to change the carpet in the sanctuary and we're going to have an open forum to discuss what color you think it should be. Yeah, you're inviting people to a fight then. Uh, and by the way, we're not doing that. Just so, I'm not, that's not us. I'm not saying that. No, 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 nothing. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. So, uh, so this scripture passage, um, if your brother or sister sins against you, it, it's one of those scripture passages that I think deserves a, a closer look because it's one of those that a lot of people just reduce to bullet points. You know, if this happens, one, two, three, that's what you do. And, and when we do that with the scripture kind of in general, we miss a lot. And we often miss the context and kind of get the deeper meaning of what's going on. So we're going we're gonna to look at this a little more closely uh, today. And, 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 and also because next week, scripture passage is the one that just follows where we are today. And, and they're related. Uh, today is more of the practical, procedural uh, kind of thing. Of if there's conflict, how do you, what do you do? Next week, it's more about the underlying principles of 
why it's important the way that we handle conflict because the whole of Matthew 18 is really about life together in the church. And so it's a good, it's a good thing for us to kind of look at a little more closely. Uh, and so that scripture passage that Terry read starts, if your brother or sister sins, pause. So how, do, how are we going to define sin here? I think that's a really important first thing. That's a really important first thing. Um, yes, I know you can say, well, it, there are things in the Bible. Yes, <laughs> but, but hang on. We've got to tread lightly about this because there's way too many people that are right, way too eager to tell what other, other people's sins are, right? So we're going to tread lightly on that, and we've got to read the rest of the phrase, and it is, if your brother or sister sins against you, so this is not just a general thing. This is not someone that has a lifestyle you don't approve of, someone who supports a, a political ideology you don't like. Somebody, no, 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 it's not that. It's if someone sins against you. So in other words, if someone has done something, said something uh, that has offended you, it's hurt your feelings, it's betrayed a trust kind of thing. It's about a break in a relationship. That I thought we were friends. I mean, it, it's that kind of thing. So it's not just in general, and it's important to note that right away. Um, so if that happens, so if that happens, you go to the person alone, and you tell them. And if they are re, and if they listen, they are regained. So it's important to note that what we're looking at here is the goal is the restoration. The goal is restoration. It's not to go to that person and to make them feel terrible about what they said or did. It's not about going to that person and taking revenge on them and, and just lighting them up. No. It's to go to the person and say, I, I just need to say that when you said that or when you did that or when you didn't do that, that really hurt. Or, or, at, you know, or whatever, or I feel like I'm not even a friend anymore, or just tell them. Go to the person. Not go to 17 other people first. Get a whole bunch of people mad at what you said or did. No, just go to the person. It, it, part of it's kind of taking the high road here. Take the high road. It's always a good idea to take the high road. So, point out their fault. In other words, what it was that they did that offended you, hurt you. And if they listened, it's restored. However, they may not. Some of, you, some of us have had the experience of trying to reconcile or restore a relationship, and they're like, no, I'm not interested in that. So, what do you do then? Well, you get one or two other people to come to be witnesses. You're not forming a posse here. This is not a gang. We're going to go gang up on this person. <laughs> no. No. Just get two or three to witness. So the way you might do that is to say to somebody, look, I've had to have a hard conversation with somebody, and it did not go well, and they did not receive what I had to say, uh, and so I just need someone who can come with me just, just to be there. I just need someone who will listen and know what was said. Part of that is accountability, right? It's accountability to me that I don't misrepresent how the conversation went, and it's accountability for the other person. That's a good thing. Somebody who can just be there and hear what it was. Their role is to, is to witness the conversation and, and to give an account if, ne if necessary. Again, with the goal of restoring things. And if it restores, great. If not, you go to the next step phase. Because if that person refuses to listen to you, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen, even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Wow, you know, there's just those things that every now and then that Jesus says, and you're like, wow, really? Yeah, those, uh, there, there are some books that have been written that are really interesting, the hard sayings of Jesus, uh, or did Jesus really say that? Yeah, there's some of those books that are, it's helpful to look at these things. So, okay. Before I proceed in talking through this, it's really important that we recognize that this verse has been misused and misunderstood by the church and Christian people for a long time to the effect that it has really hurt some people. And, and yeah, and 
it's been done for a long time. But this has been used to justify um, actions taken, things said for a long time that were very hurtful to people. And it is not at all intended to be that way. That is not at all. Because what happens is that somebody, the idea begins to be so, well, well, we know what sin is. It says so in the Bible, so we know that's a sin. We're going to tell that person that's a sin. They shouldn't do that. Oh, they, they are not going to hear that. Okay, we're going to get somebody else. We're going to go tell them you can't do that. Oh, you know what? We're going to tell the church. And, I, and, and I've heard just terrible stories of people that in their life were um, uh, shunned, alienated, some even told to leave the church because of something they went through. Sometimes something they went through that was not even of their choice. So this is not about harming other people. It's not about harming other people in any way. Not exactly what God intended in the church. I, well, I was watching a video recently, <laughs> and it was, a, it, was a confer- it was this conference of young adults, Christ- Christian conference, and the speaker was this young adult speaking, and, uh, and she was great. You know, She was really a great speaker, a great presenter, very energetic and very engaging and all those great things. And, she was, and the topic was, those of you who have, some of you are, have asked the question, you know, you, and this, this, this was the topic of the, of, some of you have asked questions about, you know, is it okay to have friends who are uh, LGBTQ? And so, of course, it's good. Of course, it's fine to have friends like that. And, and she went into the, all this stuff. She said, but, but of course, the very first thing we have to do is tell them the truth. And I was going, no, no, you missed, you know, you missed the point altogether. Because that means there's an agenda. Right off the bat, there's an agenda. That before we can be friends, or something I got to tell you that I don't like about you. Okay, I don't think that's the way Jesus addressed people. I don't think that's the way God wants the church to act at all. Because then it becomes something else. I'll say more about that in a minute. So, so you tell the church. Well, this is this is this is short on details, right? This is short on details. Exactly, how do you tell the church? When you say the church, do you mean the whole church? Do you mean? The leadership of the church, do you, I mean, what does that mean? It, it, it's really short on details. But the idea is, is, is not that we as a collective are going to ostracize somebody. But it's to let people know there is a person that has ruptured a relationship. We have tried, we have tried to restore them, but they have made the choice to remain at the fringes of our fellowship. See, that's a little different than us ostracizing. They've made a choice to stay at the fringes of our fellowship, of our, of our community. Now, we've got to know what that means, though. What does that mean exactly to do that? Jesus said, uh, treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector. Well, in Jesus' time, the word Gentile was used in a derogatory way. And especially in the Gospel of Matthew, you weren't supposed to associate with Gentiles and a tax collector was generally a Jewish person but they were hated by the Jewish community because they collected taxes on the payroll of the Roman Empire so so that doesn't sound very good does it except we always have to think of the whole of what the scripture says I said Matthew 18 is all about relationships in the church and especially when it comes to conflict what do you do with this so you've got to remember that in the first five verses of, of chapter 18, Jesus takes a child and pulls it to, into the crowd and says, this is what it looks like to be in the kingdom of heaven. Now in our day and time, sure, that makes total sense. And we smile, we ooh, and we awe, because it's a child. And we love children. And, and they run our lives. <laughs> right? Amen, amen to that. I know how to get an amen to that. Children, yeah, Right? When they say, I want to go do, okay, let's go do it. I mean, that's just, but in that society, children were more of a nuisance. It was more of the, we want you to be quiet, not, you know, we want you to be, go do something else. Because, and they had no legal rights. They were among the most vulnerable. That's why the, uh, the teaching in the, in the Old Testament was to take a spe- special care of those who are widows and orphans, orphans. If they didn't have somebody taking care of them, they were, they were, they were, they were nothing, 
They were, they were on the fringes of society. Jesus took one of the most vulnerable people and says, this is what it looks like to be in community with God. Take a child among you. In his society, that would have been a totally opposite kind of thing. Okay, so then you go to the next section, and he's talking about not being a stumbling block to people who are struggling with their faith. <laughs> be, care- be careful not that you're not a stumbling block. And then you go to the, you go to the next part, and, and it's, the story, it's the parable of the guy who had 100 sheep, and he gets back, and he counts only 99. So he leaves the 99 to go find the one, to go out maybe to the fringes of the pasture, to find the one, the one who's out there by themselves. And then next week, spoiler alert, it's all about forgiveness, boatloads of forgiveness. So when you take all of that, why in the world would Jesus say, so you're going you're gonna to be mean to this person, you're going to ostracize them, you're going to reject them? Well, no, because everywhere else in Matthew 18 is about including people. So no, he is not saying that somebody, because of choices they've made or because of whatever, means that they should not be, they should be excluded from, from the fellowship. And then at some point we always have to think, ask ourselves, so what did, what did Jesus say and do about Gentiles and tax collectors? Oh yeah, he went to dinner with them. Oh yeah, he went to their parties. Oh yeah, he hung out with them. He was kind to them. Right. Treat, so someone who's made a choice, they don't want to be a part of the fellowship, treat that person with respect. Treat that person with hospitality. Treat that person with kindness. Treat that person with patience. Because that's what Jesus did with Gentiles and tax collectors. You see why we need to walk through this scripture passage a little bit. It's not just bullet points. That when you're angry about something, this is what you do. It's not that. It's not that. Because the goal, again, is restoration. And so then, so then you get to that, to that, uh, the, that, those two or three verses that even the scholars kind of scratch their heads about. Where, where Jesus says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you, if two or three of you agree on, about, on earth about anything you ask... It will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. A little bit of a head scratcher on some of this, to be honest. Uh, The main point is, he's talking about in the community. Jesus is among us. Jesus is a part of all of this. And And so when we can say that something is bound or loosed. We, this is a decision. This is we're going to leave open-ended. This, this is a part of, the, of the, the inhaling and exhaling of the community. And the teaching is always to take the high road together. So I mentioned uh, John Wesley earlier. Uh, there's, uh, um, he, again, completely practical. Uh, the late Bishop Reuben Job I uh, did a lot of study uh, in John Wesley's uh, writings uh, and, 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 and wrote some, some really great books about how to apply what John Wesley said in the 18th century in England to what it means to live as a, as a Methodist Christian today. And so one of, the, one of the things that he came up with was just this little book called Three Simple Rules. Some of you have seen this, you've heard this. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, not gonna, it's not real big. So it's not, not going to take you several weeks uh, to read. But the, the three simple rules are this. Um, first, do no harm. Do no harm. So if someone has sinned against you, do no harm here. Do no harm. I think that's always a great first rule. I don't need to add to the misery. I don't need to add to the pain. I don't need to take vengeance on a situation. I'm going to do no harm. Secondly, do all the good you can. Do all the good you can. I love the way that's phrased because we are to be agents of good. I mean, even the, uh, a passage that was read in uh, recent weeks here was where Paul said, uh, do not return evil for evil, but return good for evil. We're to be agents of good. So do all the good you can because 
any one of us can't do all the good. We can't do all the good. But we can do the good I can. You can do the good you can. We can do the good I can. Do all the good you can. And the third rule is to stay in love with God. Because this is not just a, this is not a self-help book. <laughs> this is not something that's just to make you a more uh, realized individual. It's, it's, about, it's about a relationship with God. And that what God intends, and matter of fact, how all of this is modeled is how God, as the Bible teaches, we were estranged from God. And God came to us and said, look, there's some things that have broken the relationship, and I want to restore it. And the Bible is story after story after story of how God has come to us seeking reconciliation and restoration. And Jesus is saying, and that's the example for us too. Certainly in the church, certainly in life. So those Sunday school teachers were really frustrated because they were tired of getting to their classrooms on Sunday morning and there was a mess or something was broken, or something was missing, because they were going to use that in the lesson that day, and it was gone. Those preschool teachers don't respect our stuff. So, so I, I did a lot of listening, and, um, and after a while I said, well, uh, you know, every now and then you have that, that moment where you know exactly the right thing to say. It almost never happens to me. Almost never. Uh, 99 times, I don't know. And then one time I'll get some. And in that moment, I, I had a response that was actually helpful. And I said, so how, how did it go when you told them about this? And they sat there pretty quiet for a moment. And one of them said, well, we haven't talked to them. Okay. I said, well, I'll tell you what, before that... Have you, have you made sure the custodian knows the way you need the room set up so that they know what you're expecting so that when you walk in, it's ready? Well, no, we haven't done that. Okay, well, I'm, that, might be, that might be a good start. And I said, and, and so what if, could I, what if I made a list of all the preschool teachers and the rooms that they use and their contact information, and I'll give them the list of all of you and the rooms you use and your contact information, and if you have an issue, you can just talk to each other. What about that? Well, yeah, okay. That'd be okay. Okay, good meeting. Good meeting, thank you. Now we can leave. <laughs> what I didn't say was that there were complaints from the preschool about the condition of those rooms on Monday morning. <laughs> yeah, it can work both ways. It can work both ways. But, that's, but that, but that when, when, there's some, when there's a conflict, there's a disagreement, there's a hurt, there's a betrayal, there's a whatever it is, that act of going to the person is, it, it is in a sense, it's taking the high road. I mean, that's, that's a, we, we're familiar with that idea. I'm going to take the high road. I'm going to take the high road every time. It's always the way to go. The view is much better on the high road. Amen.